What's happening, everybody? Here we are. Another episode of the Slap Stream. And I'm here with you again. Uh, my name is George Stiepovic, your friendly neighborhood bull fiddle cat. And I'm still not at Slapsville. I can't wait to go back. I'm This time I'm in Serbia. I'm in Belgrade, Serbia, which is basically my hometown. I moved to the States like 15, 16 years ago. Uh, but I always enjoy coming back even during these crazy times. And today we have a very, very, very special guest. Uh, every guest is special, but I feel that, you know, every time I feel that, you know, the guest that I have um, each day is kind of like a more, more and more special. Um, you probably know who that is, but I have to mention, I believe that so far, this is the only bass player that, that's been in the, um, Music Hall of Fame, this time Bluegrass Hall of Fame, twice. Um, as you know, Tom Gray is uh, my guest, my featured guest today. And he's been um, uh, introduced to, to, uh, to in, 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 in inducted into uh, Bluegrass Hall of Fame with the Country Gentleman, uh, I believe in 19, 1996, and then um, seldom seen again, like in uh, 2014. So those two bands were very essential for um, for the bluegrass music, and I'm really excited to talk about uh, uh, to talk about bluegrass and slapping bluegrass and bass in bluegrass with Tom, since I really always admired his playing. Uh, basically, since I read about him in Mark Rubin's uh, recommended riffs in Bass Player magazine in like late '90s or something, and I found his recordings first with country gentlemen then with the other bands and you know i i just love tom's playing and there's quite quite a few of you already here so my first question has to be do you hear me well um so if you guys don't mind commenting on the side you have a live chat and please tell me if you hear me well so so i know that everything is right please give me a thumbs up and in the meantime, uh, don't forget to sub subscribe to my channel. Um, subscribe button should be somewhere here. And um, live chat is active while we're premiering this video on the side. So feel free to ask any questions you have like for me or for Tom. Uh, we'll do our best to, to answer that. And um, uh, I would like to use this occasion to thank to um, a few new Patreons that we have. If you feel like supporting my channel and what I'm doing, please check out the donation links that I put out under the video. It's uh, in the description. And please check out, you have Venmo and PayPal, and please check out Patreon. It's a, it's a great website. You can, it's, it really helps a lot. But the main thing, make sure to subscribe and like the video comment and share it so that we have uh so that i'm doing this like for all these people that are excited about music and i want to do that for free forever or for as long as i have strength to do it so please share these videos and tell your friends if they're interested in the, all these cool stories to check out the channel all right it seems that we're good to go marshall wilburn said that audio is great uh, so, so I guess that it's a good time to introduce my guest. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce my guest for today, Tom Gray. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Do you hear me, Tom? How are you? I hear you and I see you. Perfect. Yeah. How do I you feel? Oh, I'm doing wonderful, not playing enough music these days. I guess no one is. No one. But we have to keep our chops up somehow. Yes. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I decided to start doing the slap stream so that people actually can, you know, have some music in their lives and then, you know, like progress somehow. Like people are happy about it. So we try to do that uh, tonight as well um did you have any gigs like last few months like since this whole mess started 
Yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I played a very brief appearance at a dear friend's funeral a month ago out in a cemetery when uh, the interment was happening with the husband and wife uh, of the, the best friends of John Duffy. Uh, their daughter asked me in a carriage, could we come play? And so I enlisted our friend Bob Perilla to come and sing Heaven. They loved the song Heaven, which their hero, everyone's hero, John Duffy, sang so well. So we stood out there social distancing in a cemetery, played and sang Heaven. It's not really, it wasn't a paying gig. <laughs> it, uh, the last paying gig I had was a festival in Florida in early March. One festival that had been scheduled in June, they decided to try to do it late August. So it's still on the calendar. It will be the Wind Gap Festival, Wind Gap, Pennsylvania. Uh, and the manager of that festival, Harry Grant, is arranging ways to keep everyone uh, appropriately distant from each other. And we're planning to still have that festival. It will be the last weekend in August of this year. Well, hopefully it's going to happen, especially hopefully. if it's Who outside, knows? you know, there's a chance. It just, it, it just may wind up having to be canceled again. Well, we're all in a same boat about that. Well, well let's, Let's go back to the happier times. I want to hear um, how did you choose to start playing bass and how what what was your first uh, experience with the bass? Your, do you remember your first lick? Do you remember the songs that you were learning and you know stuff like that? What I remember about learning the bass and wanting to play the bass, I had never touched a bass in my hand, but once I started liking this music that eventually would be known as bluegrass, it was just part of country and hillbilly music back in the 50s when I was a kid. I used to sit on my bed listening to the radio or to records and I would play bass on the guitar. I always wish I could get a real bass fiddle in my hand and see if I could play those notes. And, uh, you know, before I'd even had my hands on a bass, I was already playing bass runs uh, on my guitar. Uh, I eventually met other people who liked this kind of music and we started jamming together. And someone who was well known in bluegrass circles as a bassist, Tom Morgan, who was the first official bass player in the country gentleman, had been at a rehearsal in my parents' basement and he left his bass there overnight. Wow, I got a whole bass that I can work with overnight. So thanks to Tom Morgan, I got to try out all of those things. Uh, then I went down to the pawn shop and bought a bass that I could afford and started jamming with people. And I gave up my position as the mandolin player in my high school band so I could become the bass player. Oh, so mandolin was your first instrument? Well, not exactly the first. <laughs> My first instrument was an accordion, mm -hmm. then, a, then a piano, then a ukulele, then a guitar, then a mandolin. Oh, wow. okay. I would recommend anyone who wants to get a feel for musical theory to play an accordion. The way the bass buttons on the accordion are arranged, it's in this circle of fifths, and you can hear and feel the... Uh, intervals of chords uh, when it moves uh, up the circle of the fifths or down the circle of fifths, you're moving up a row of buttons mm. on the accordion. So uh, by listening 
to, to, to music as you play it, uh, it just uh, becomes a second nature that you hear those chords and you know how they relate to each other. Anyway. You know, I never th thought about it. I always recommend piano because you can actually oh, yeah. see, but I, you, you might be right. Accordion might be even better because you can feel the bass with the left hand. Yeah, on a piano accordion with the keyboard type, you can see the intervals that you see on the keyboard piano. Yes. yes. They're, they're both good to start you in uh, theory. Of course. I mean, so they're definitely I, better than a bass because on a bass you can't see anything. I had been studying classical music on the piano, but then I heard hillbilly music and, and was really excited by it. So I got a guitar uh, and gradually the piano and the accordion got set aside and how how old were you back then when you started playing hillbilly music you said that it was called the hillbilly back in the day not bluegrass yet they, they called it hillbilly uh, uh or sometimes they called it country and western uh, or hillbilly as their slang nickname for it and then somehow the uh, music industry people in Nashville decided that they wanted to be just country. And the word Western was dropped from it. And that was around the time that they also dropped bluegrass from much of commercial country music. Mm -hmm. When I started listening to it, then the, the, the bluegrass and the uh, the, the Western songs uh, were all part of what was country and Western or hillbilly. Oh. This would have been, I would have been 14 years old in 1955. That's when I got turned on to it and, and got my first guitar. Uh, and I That's when you started I, guitar, okay. I thought I was the only kid in the city who liked this strange country kind of music. I thought this was just music played by old people from the country. And uh, I was very much surprised when eventually I did meet other city kids like me who liked it. And like me, they bought instruments and they wanted to play it. So uh, I, I got to meet them and, and that's when I started playing the mandolin. Uh, so I could play with my friend who had the guitar and sang songs. Uh, and I, and during all of that time, I really wanted to be a bass player. There are a lot of bass players in music who would really rather be playing some other instrument, but they pick up the bass because they can get a gig that way. I really yeah, it might, might be easier. Yeah. I always identified with the low root of whatever music I was hearing. Uh, and I'm sure that people can feel that when they're listening to you and your bass lines. I frequently meet people who have the same impression of music. They anchor their head to the bass line of music. So I was one. And since those were like mid fifties, were you influenced by Rockabilly and Elvis and that whole thing back then at all? Or were you more on that countryside? I was influenced by it. I actually bought a few of Elvis Presley's early records uh, in which he had uh, Bill Black playing his slap bass. Uh, but I gravitated toward the more traditional uh, folky kind of songs and the highly improvisational bluegrass music. At the time, bluegrass didn't yet have a name, uh, but it made sense that they named it after Bill Monroe's band, the Bluegrass Boys. Uh, and honestly, it really was more like jazz because the people were playing uh, fancy improvised breaks on the mandolins and banjos and fiddles. Uh, uh, so it, it was really a kind of a, 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 of a country jazz until it got the name bluegrass. And since you mentioned that, uh, um, that 
that the, the, the whole style was named by Bill Monroe's uh, uh, band because he had bluegrass voice. And I remember, I think that he started the band uh, kind of in the early 40s, right? Like a bluegrass voice. So the style was not named bluegrass until the 50s? Right. Uh, his band was the Bluegrass Boys. Blue and grass was two words the way he spelled it. Yep. Uh, uh, and other people started copying his sound and uh, eventually it, it, it got a name. Uh, Bill Monroe's band really began in 1939, and he proudly said that. That's when he joined the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, and he always fit, featured a lot of fiddle playing. Uh, he had... Uh, Chubby Wise playing fiddle. Uh, before he got Earl Scruggs on banjo, he had uh, String Bean. His real name is David Aikman, but he had a uh, comedy routine and uh, went by the stage name of String Bean. Uh, the early Bill Monroe recordings uh, that had a banjo had String Bean. Some of them earlier than that had no banjo at all. Like Monroe's first recording of Mule Skinner Blues, uh, Monroe played the guitar. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he, uh, more so than other people in that time, he always wanted to have a bass. He had a bass fiddle. Uh, and at that time, like who was playing bass for, for Bill Monroe? Was it uh, Amos Guerin or it was Cousin Wilbur? Before Cousin Wilbur, uh, the only one I can name is the one who famously was a part of the original bluegrass band, which was when the style finally congealed. It wasn't until 1945 when he had Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs and Chubby Wise and Cedric Rainwater on the base. Now, Cedric Rainwater was the stage name of Howard Watts. Yeah. Then a bass player had to also be a clown, dress up like a clown and do comedy. Well, Howard did that and he went by the name of Cedric Rainwater. Uh, he was a very good, solid bass player. In those recordings of the uh, first bluegrass band that had Lester and Earl and Shelby and Bill. Uh, Howard Watts was driving them home uh, very strongly. Uh, I think he also played with a lot of uh, country stars back then, like Hank Williams. Yep. I think that he's the only guy that played with both Bill Monroe and Hank Williams. The only bass player. The only it's kind of surprising player. for me, but... I think... Yeah. Some fiddle players could have played with both of them. As far as bass guys, bass uh, as far as the, the bass player, yeah. Now, the early bass solos on Monroe's recordings are all in a 12 bar blues format. Like for years, that was the only time bass players were allowed to take a solo. You play boogie woogie notes, boom, 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 boom. Uh, that's what you did. That's what was on uh, Monroe's Bluegrass Stomp uh, and uh, Bluegrass Special, another instrumental he did. Uh, both of them were 12 bar blues tunes and they both had a bass break. Uh, there was no slapping on the bass in his group. I don't know if he told them not to, uh, but it was just not a part of his act. Now, after Flat and Scruggs left Bill Monroe and started their own band, they evolved a, a, a very infectious kind of rhythm, which really needed just a simple bass, just the one and five notes. Uh, but their bass player, uh, there was Jody Rainwater, 
who was a wonderful fellow, played bass with Rotten Scruggs. And uh, was that before I, Jake Tullock? Jake came along very soon after okay. after Jody. Uh, they would both play just a light slap on the upbeat of, of a tune, uh, kind of a discreet thing, just kind of like your mandolin chop in a bluegrass band or a, a snare drum in, in a, another kind of music. Uh, there would be a light slap that uh, oh gosh, <laughs> what is the name? Uh, people's not, I forget people. Of course, Jake. <laughs> Jake, 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 Jake Tullock. My mind for a moment. Yeah, oh, okay. Jake played that light slap. But when they gave Jake a chance to play a solo, he was featured playing slap bass, and it became famous. His, his version of Little Darling Pal of Mine, it's still being copied by people. I love that. I love that one, and I love the, You Can't Stop Me From Dreaming. I think that both... Yes, are, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, both of those tunes evolved as something that Earl and Jake would play if someone else in the band broke a string and had to leave the stage for a moment. Then it was time for the bass and the band to have their turn. And so I, I used to be in the same rock. Uh, I would only get to play uh, a bass solo on those tunes. And uh, as tradition had it, we would play Little Darling Pal of Mine again and again and again. <laughs> uh, and eventually, with the gentleman, we started playing Grandfather's Clock. Uh, it wasn't my idea. Walt Hensley was our banjo player for only two months. Uh, during all of, all of my time with the country gentleman, except for those two months, the banjo player was always Eddie Adcock, who really was well suited for the uh, progressive for that day music that Jets played. But uh, when we had that situation where the bass and banjo had to play a tune, Walt said, you know, we don't have to keep playing Little Darling Pal of Mine. Have you ever tried to play Grandfather's Clock? I said, hey, maybe that would work. So we started doing it. And for some reason, uh, we never included that uh, little kind of a bridge part of the song, with, with, uh, some uh, TikTok part of the song. That was never part of what we did as Grandfather's Clock. Uh, but we started doing it that way. So I, I could play a bass solo, picking it all the way, including the melody of the song as well as I could. Then I would do a, a later solo, slapping it. As long as my endurance could keep up slapping, sometimes I lost the energy to keep it going. Guys like you can do it forever and ever. Uh, but you, you were the influence, and you know, I think that uh, lots of people associate Grandfather's Clock uh, with, with you, and it, it was introduction of the slap bass style to lots of bass players. And uh, oh. I would like to mention just like a few things that we were talking about it earlier, uh, about little, uh, little um, uh, uh, Darling Pal of Mine, that that was also introduction to slap bass to many... Uh, bass players, like later on, like Roger Bush was talking about that song, how it influenced him and introduced him to slap. And um, and before that, we were talking about Bluegrass, uh, Bluegrass Voice and Bill Monroe. And I think that the earliest songs that were I found that had some slap, and I'm pretty sure that was Cousin Wilbur, and I'm... Oh. I'm not positive about these things, but I think that the first bass player that played uh, bass with uh, Bill Monroe was Amos Guerin, and that, that that's how I understood that it was Amos Guerin in 1939, and then it came Cousin Wilbur, and that they did those recordings at, um, at that hotel in Atlanta, and then I know that at that session they recorded Tennessee Blues and Blue Yodel Number no. 7 and Honky Tonk Swing, that had yeah. little slap solos. And I believe those three songs, ah. I mean, those are those three songs were the earliest 
slap examples in bluegrass music that I found. And those are 1940 and 1941, I think, or th 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 around that 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 period. And uh, for me, it was that. Yeah. for me it was always mind-boggling that you kind of like the earliest rec bluegrass recordings were with slap, with cousin Wilbur, and later on with uh, Cedric Rainwater or uh, Rainwater or uh, uh, Howard Watts. And then you know, 20 years later, almost nobody played slap. So it was. I don't know why. Do you know why did why did slap kind of disappear in bluegrass music? No, hey, there are some very good slap players uh, playing these days, uh, and I like to hear it. Uh, I mean, my slapping chops are, are are really quite modest. I do some of it when I think I can get away with it. Uh, you know, I, I like to play for the choice of notes and the melodic uh, line that will leave, lead you from one part of a song to the next part of a song. I, I like to work those out and I usually try to make them uh, with a, as sweet a tone as I can get on, on the instrument. And quite frankly, you know, slapping and the energy that goes with it doesn't match too well with the smooth tone that I try to get most of the time when I'm playing. Does that make sense? Of course, of course. And um, I would let's, but you know, it's going to make even more sense when you play something. So do you mind playing a little bit <laughs> or as long as you want? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me, uh, let me play something. Yeah. I've, All right. Face Bessie right back here behind me. I'm going to move the microphone so it picks up both of us. Uh, I don't know. I will feature you. I see that Mark Rubin yeah. is here. Like, thanks, Mark Rubin. And thanks to you, Mark Rubin. I actually found, found out about Tom and Grandfather's Clock. But there are like a few other. Uh, so, so solos, slap oh. solos and bluegrass before we can talk that in private. Um, all right, so Tom, what do you want to play? Just, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay. I, I'm, I'm gonna play and sing a tune that's always fun to play in jam sessions or in stages. Alabama Jubilee. You ought to see Deacon Jones when he rattles his bones. Whole bars and brown dance and run like a clown. Old as your mama, fast 83. Shouting not for the pep. Wash your step, wash your step. One naked Joe dancing round on his toe. Goes away his question hunters. Hey, let her go, honey. Hey, hail the gang's over here for the Alabama to Jazz tunes that's fun to play with a bluegrass band. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's how common was it like to play to use to play jazz tunes in bluegrass style? Uh we started doing that frequently when I was in Country Gentleman, but really the credit should go uh to Flatten Scruggs, who made their uh uh, banjo instrumental of Farewell Blues. That's a jazz standard that they started doing uh, and, and they, they did more. But when I was in The Gentleman, our two jazz instrumentals that we played a lot always got good response from crowds. And I still play it on stage with my dear friend, Eddie Adcock. Uh, we play Heartaches, 
we play Sunrise. Now, the tune that we called Sunrise is actually modeled after that guitar jazz tune called The World is Waiting on the Sunrise, but we changed some chords. Uh, we were still in the uneducated hillbilly mode where we didn't know what a diminished chord was. So uh, the way we played Sunrise, it, it went to the six minor rather than to the diminished chord. But uh, it's basically the same tune. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. I love like hearing those. Uh, those kind of reasons like why the chords were changed or melody because fans like years later or now trying to figure out they say oh no no this is a minor or it's oh it's a minor seven no it's a minor six or diminished or half diminished what were yeah. they doing and you hear a different different version and it's like oh no this is this is you know when you play bluegrass you play this way when you play the same tune in jazz it's Different, different chord, but yeah, no, it's kind I, of great I, I, to hear I, I, that it's like, oh, we just were able to play this way, not this way. I love to hear bands who will have alternate chord progressions that, that they put into songs that uh, that they've heard otherwise. Um, that, 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 that's a good thing in music. I can't think of uh, examples right now, but uh, it, it it happens and. Uh, we sort of did it with our version of Sunrise. And one thing that I wanted to ask you, what what did uh, your band leaders uh, back in those days and then later on, even now, like what did they think about Slap? Were they encouraging you to do it or were they kind of like more like, oh, this is not really bluegrass. Don't don't slap it that way. So what 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 was their opinion about it? I was encouraged to do more by Buzz Busby. Buzz was a, uh, a, a well-known pioneer in our local Washington area bluegrass scene, country scene. Uh, and uh, I had mentioned earlier in our talk here today, uh, before I had joined the Country Gentleman, uh, I was playing uh, a weekly gig with Buzz Busby and P. Pike. And uh, they wanted me to make a sound like bass and drums at the same time. So they encouraged me to play the slap. When I joined the gentleman, somehow it just didn't seem like it was going to fit their style. And so I really did not suggest it until we started doing Grandfather's Clock. Uh, and I did it in that, in that song. There were a few tunes we'd play on stage where I would try to mimic the uh, groove that Flat and Scruggs got with their uh, discreet little bass tap on the upbeat. Uh, and often it, it went unnoticed by, by everyone, but uh, I think... Uh, you know, part of the bass player's job is to uh, create a, a a a feeling for for what they're hearing, and that that little slap gives a groove that can make people rock to the rhythm, uh, and and they like it whether they realize they're hearing it or not. Uh, so that was sort of discreet there. So blue, blue, uh, blue. Your band leaders were fine with you using um, slap outside of bass solos as well. Not usually outside of the solos. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, when I was with Seldom Seen, we did record our version of Tennessee Blues, the same one you mentioned with an earlier Bill Monroe configuration, uh, and I did play a slap break on that. Uh, and gosh, it, I would have to build up my adrenaline and get ready because I'm going to need a lot of energy to get through this each time we were to play it. And I feel that way now whenever somebody asks me to play Grandfather's Clock. I said, I'm, I'm going to get it going too fast and I'm going to fall apart and not, not be able to complete what I have started. 
But I'm getting to try it again. Your your plane and your slap plane like influence so many people. So it's you know, I'm sure that everyone loves like seeing you and hearing you play slap or not slap. So we just we're really happy that you, you know, wanted to do this and that you're sharing your knowledge. Uh do you want to play one of those songs now or a couple of those songs now? Like how well, do you feel? Okay, since we talked about it, and I've already told you that I sometimes get embarrassed because I make too many mistakes. I'm old. Yeah, I'm getting old. I'm 79 years old, but I'm still playing this thing, and I'm, I don't want to quit. So yeah, I'll, 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 uh, I'm going to pick up Bessie and, uh, and, and attempt to play Grandfather's Clock. All right. Since we had talked about that, okay. Uh... I uh, know what we would do. We'd play it in G. Uh, my first bass solo, I would usually just be picking, bass, basically trying to play the melody of the tune. Uh, oh, by the way, all you bass players, if you're listening, you know, when you do have to play a solo, you have two choices. Play the melody if you can find it, and if you can't figure out the melody right off the top of your head, just play runs through the chords of the tune. So uh, what I'm doing with these solos is playing the melody as close as I can, but I'm filling it in with other rhythm notes uh, that go with the chords of the tune. So anyway, here's Grandfather's. I get it going too fast, and I make too many mistakes. But but forgive me, my friends. You're you sound great. You no. so, sound great, and I love that song uh, when you play it. And um, we're talking. We usually have a, a, a section where it's a slap bass lesson with a featured guest. But unfortunately, I don't have my bass with me here, so I have to go back to the Slapsville. So I want some back. Uh, can we do a, a slap lesson for all these guys that are watching, like at a later date? Yes, yes. Awesome! I can't wait. Um, now, I I try to analyze. You can have a, a simple. slap in the same place. Uh, you can do a single slap, uh, which I, I call kind of an interrupted triplet. It's as if you were doing triplets. You're only playing the last of those two triplet notes. Uh, sometimes when I'm playing solos, I will play a full triplet. Uh, you can use that uh, interrupted triplet. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of some songs. The place you could use it 
Now, <laughs> this is a Bill Monroe tune. I don't think Monroe ever did it like this. But, but of course, uh, it, one of his popular tunes, uh, I'm Blue, I'm Lonesome. Lonesome, lonesome side of the train going by makes me want to stop. Okay, now, I don't know, you, you get that, that triplet, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And you, uh, you pick on the one and you slap on the three, except for in a few spots where you can fill in the hole. And, and get them all, get all three of them. There's another triplet thing I like to do, which is not picking the notes on the downbeat, uh, sort of like a three-finger banjo roll. When you play the notes, uh, if, uh, if you, you have a pattern of, actually it sounds kind of like a Hispanic music. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. In certain songs at certain tempos, that's a cool thing to do. The band I'm playing with currently, uh, Valerie Smith and Liberty Pike, we recorded a kind of a comedy song. So I thought this would be a good place to use the uh, novelty thing of, of, the, of, of the slap bass. But I only do it in the ending of the song. I'll just I'll, let me do my ending for that. Like that. Which is playing, it's like the, the three note pattern with an, a, a note and two slaps, a note, two slaps, a note, and one slap. So the next note is going to be our next downbeat. Uh, it's the same kind of pattern you get with a three finger banjo roll. <laughs> that ending I, I just did with the triple with the triplets in it. You know, note wise, is very similar to the uh, to the bass ending on uh, on uh, what's it. Uh, Ground speed, flat, uh, 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 I can't do it. The same nose, but but a different, a different slap. Uh, 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 well, those are all things for, uh, I well, love everything that you're playing, but uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you: uh, what would what would be a like if we talk about terminology? What what would be a single slap for you? Okay, okay. and so so if you if you just slap one note without that uh, back slap, what wh how would you call that? Uh, uh, a note without without a slap in. Not pizzicato, but if you if you pull the string, 
Yeah. Well, you know, I think of that as a snap rather than a okay. slap. Because you snap the string snap the string against the fingerboard. So when you're playing a slap bass pattern, the snap is always a part of it. Okay. So maybe uh what some people talk about are the triple slap counts that snap as one of the slaps. I count it. I mean, one of the reasons why I do that is because... Oh, oh Sorry. I'm too old to do this. Yeah. You call that triple slap? You call that a double slap? Uh, that I would call gallop, but it would be part of the triple slap. It wouldn't be a triplet because it's uh, rhythmically not a triplet. Because the first, it's uh, we have three, we have eight notes and um, two sixteenth note hits, which would be a gallop for me. But the triple, yeah, yeah, the triple okay. slap That's because right. a okay. string string is making a slap, and and uh, the and then you're slapping. You know, so um, and the the main reason why I, why I call that way is because, like in early jazz, for example, if we're listening to Pops Foster and Bill Johnson and all those guys, and rockabilly bass players like Bill Black or James Kirkland, they were playing just, but they were slapping the bass. Nobody was talking in those genres. Nobody was talking about snapping the bass. So. Yeah. I like asking okay. these questions to, to, to each guest that I have. And I noticed that especially bluegrass bass players call um, that one note, they call it snap. And then they, the, the bluegrass bass players usually uh, call slaps only the hits that you have with the, with the palm. Not, they don't count the, 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 the string, which is the same thing which you did. It, it yeah, was yeah. interesting. I think that's what I was calling it with a snap and two slaps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the pattern that you that you call like tinka to tinka to tinka tinka to tinka to tinka. Yeah, I would call? not call those triplets. I would call them triple, two triple and one double because there's three three two. Uh but it would be a rumba slap, a rumba slap. So yeah, it's, it's, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of like yeah. made sense for me when I was writing down all of that and analyzing. Yeah, you make a kind of rumble beat. Uh, My bass with me, but which which section are you talking about? Oh, wait a minute! I, I didn't get that question exactly. Yeah. Uh, like I'm, I don't have my bass with me, so I cannot play the same thing which you're doing. But what which you said, like how would we call? Uh, how would we analyze what we're doing? So which which section were you talking about? Uh, well, that kind of Latin, the rumba. That sounds like a good word for it. Yeah. Is... Yeah, that would be a rumba for me. So, uh, and you know, you can play it, but you can play the same notes without the slap. Yes. And when you do that, you have to be careful to hit the second note before the downbeat comes because you're playing that pattern of threes uh you, you don't go that, that, that is pretty square rhythm it, yeah. 
Yeah, we have like a two two quarter uh, dotted quarter notes and one uh, quarter uh, one quarter note at the end as the opposite to uh, the one that you called more square that you just played, which is a half note and two quarter notes. So yeah. for rumba, we definitely have two two dotted quarter notes and one regular quarter note. Um, Oh, gosh. While you're holding the bass, like we got um, a couple of questions about your strings. Oh, yeah. And I remember that I read in one of your interviews, I believe it, it was in that Bluegrass book that came out in the 80s or sometime around that, that you played. Yeah. Um, I think that you played, uh, that, that you recommended gut strings for, for uh, slap yeah. or nylon strings for slap. And um, but that you, that you were often using gut strings in a combination with a uh, um, with a steel E string, so that that was okay. I believe that was your your, uh, your strings of choice back then. Uh, as you might have been able to see with this, I've gone back to using plain gut strings on this bass uh, for years, as long as I could still find them. I always use Golden Spiral on the G and D string, uh, golden spiral with gut core with a plastic winding. Uh, uh, and I usually would use some sort of a steel A and E to go with the gut D and G strings. Uh, I tried so many sets of strings, different kinds of things. I've tried those steel strings and, and, and I, I really learned to hate those tomastic strings. They're too boingy sounding and they're so tiny and thin that when you pick them, you get blood blisters on your finger. Uh, I like the fat, sweet sound of gut. I like the softer feel when you play it. Uh, I found some strings that I really loved about eight years ago when I discovered velvet brand strings uh i believe the velvet have a silk core with a plastic winding or a copper winding uh, nice thing about the velvet strings they would match each other perfectly well from the high string to the low string so i could buy a complete set and uh the uh the, the tone and volume was very, was very close all the way around. Uh, I've tried the ovations. I've tried other. I've tried. To me, nylon strings are a little too loose and floppy. I went back to these gut strings. Uh, what I have on here now are um, Lenzner brand. I think they're made in Germany. Uh, I mean, it's so plain, you actually have to tie a knot in the string to attach it to your pedal piece. Uh, but it felt good going back to that gut string. I put on a whole set of them and decided that the E was too loose and floppy. So I found one of my old Tomastic E's and put it on there. I don't like the uh, metallic twang of a new tomastic steel string, uh, but after they've aged a bit, they lose some of that edge uh, and, uh, and they don't sound bad with the gut strings. There used to be a common popular set of strings that all of the bass players here around DC played for years uh and that was the golden spiral on the top along with a uh tomastic a and e uh, i used that set for years ed ferris used them uh, uh, bill yates used them uh, i always wish that my hero george shuffler had had tried them uh I think when when George was a uh, a busy bass player, I think he had gut strings, and like me, he decided that E doesn't have much power to it, so he would 
tune his E string to a G. So he could not play any notes lower than the G on it. So that was George's own unique tuning. Uh, but for me, for my playing and uh, uh, others, you know, I want to use that. I want to go down to the low F and E. Uh, and I think I can get good sound out of it. Well, you I, still can, and so 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 George was the, uh, tuning the E string to, uh, to he was um, on the, to G, and everything yeah. else was the same, was normal. That's what George Shuffler did when he played bass. That's interesting, huh? It is. I never heard about it. Now, if you want to hear some good uh, bass, uh, George Shuffler was my hero. I wanted to be like George when I grew up. Uh, I loved his walking bass on the early Stanley Brothers, Mercury Records, uh, Our Last Goodbye, and uh, This Weary Heart You Stole Away. Listen to those songs and listen to the driving bass that George plays. And it, it matches very well with the driving uh, banjo that Ralph was playing at the time. And George did some tremendous bass work when he was with Don Reno and Bill Harrell. Uh, they featured his bass all the way through their recording of Big Train. Uh, you can see a video of them performing Big Train on, uh, oh gosh, they're on well, some big country star TV program. Oh God, I forget people's names all the time. Uh, Porter Wagner, ah, they okay. were on the Porter Wagner show, and they played Big Train, and you can see the camera zooms in on George's hand. Now, uh, George's right hand was something, uh, it, it was just kind of loose and floppy when he played. Uh, I and other players were, were trying for a clean tone. We generally will uh, br We'll brace our thumb against the fingerboard and kind of pinch off on the string. Uh, George would never do that. His hand was all always just dangling like a pendulum. So Interesting. <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was very aggressive in, in uh, all the notes he, cho he chose to play. Interesting. And I read somewhere that, uh, that, that you said that you never heard him slapping. And I never found any of his recordings uh, where he used slap. And I also read that many other bass players chose him as their heroes, even slappers like uh, uh, like uh, George Bush. Like he was, he was also talking about George Shuffler as a, one of his heroes. He was not a slapper, right? I don't think he was a slapper. No. Okay. I, I've recently gotten back into some of the early slap bass players and. Uh, Really, I'm blown. I'm blown away by the uh, slap bass by Joe Zinkin. Uh, <laughs> we all are. We all he's are. A player. I mean, he, he, he's he's like you, Georgia. He's uh, <laughs> he's full of energy. Uh, and when you see this middle-aged white guy wearing a suit, going bananas, going crazy on the bass, uh, it, it, <laughs> it can blow your mind. It's, yeah, he's he's still a hero, like to everyone. He was really now, amazing. Before, and, I had, before I had ever heard uh, Joe Zinkin's uh, flashy slapping solos, I really loved his choice of notes, just playing for tone, in Mac Wiseman's album "Beside mm -hmm. the Still Waters." It's okay. a gospel album with just Mac and his guitar and the bass. Joe, Joe Zinkin is playing very tasteful bass. Just a few lead in notes here and there between the lines. Very well chosen. Uh, I loved what Joe did on that. He was really good. Excellent musician. He's he's no, uh, choice of notes and he's slapping was so precise and so tasteful. 
Amazing. Do you uh, remember any, I mean, back from those old days, like, do you remember any of his, uh, any of the songs where he used slap or like any of the recordings? We are now all familiar with, uh, you know, with those little um, music clips that Ken Blanton put up on YouTube and they're, they're amazing. But do you remember something like from back from the old days? Oh gosh, you know, songs, uh, you're asking the songs that I used to play slap in. Uh, uh, okay, well, well, I, I, I might embarrass myself again. <laughs> you, you, you're never going to embarrass yourself. You're, you're, there's a reason why you're here. Okay. We all admire you. Well, we are we are among friends and, 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 and we have exactly. Sympathy. Uh, and, and slap bass community is one of the best communities out there. So, oh, oh, this bass, this is a card mysel bass card in okay. Wald, Germany. Uh, it's not an antique, it was only made 1955. This has been my main instrument since I bought it in 1973. Before that, you had a, a plywood base, you know, and then I read that when you switched to Carl Meisel, I think that you mentioned that it was a 9900V was the number or like something about it. And then that you were like really happy with your tone. My plywood base had no label on it, so I don't know what make it was. Uh, so I don't think it was a K. Ks usually were labeled somewhere in the tailpiece or in a decal inside no uh but I, I tried to make them sound the best i could i uh, now since we're talking about base uh the uh, construction is the plywood or card is up what made me decide I'd, i have to get a card base mike aldridge's first album it, it would have been about 1972 when we had uh, just started the seldom scene he had five different bass players some of them acoustic some of them electric out of and i was one of the five out of all of those bases, it was Ed Ferris's bass that sounded the best, the best tone. And so I decided then I needed to get a card bass. So uh, I went down to my uh, violin shop and uh, and I bought this one. This is the only card bass I've ever had. Anyway, what I was starting to do when I got this, I uh, talked about when I used to play the slap. I used to play that kind of uh, commercial country of the 50s, which was kind of like rockabilly. And Buzz Busby always wanted to sing those George Jones songs. Uh, so. Well, the race is on and it looks like right in the back Finally, it's growing and feels so my tears That's what I used to do when I was 18 years old, and we played uh, several nights a week in, in, in a club. I sort of put that aside when I joined the gentleman. I didn't think that the uh, slapping was appropriate for what they were doing at the time. Like I said, they, they played some jazz tunes. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, I talked about uh, a version of uh, Sunrise. Let me play Sunrise.
and that's what we did. They let me play that solo, which of course was all picking and and no slapping. Now, when I play with Eddie and Martha, they always like to put me on the spot. They'll ask me to take a second solo in that tune, which I never used to do in the old days. And I might try to do some slapping in it when I do it these days with them. But I've got to feel uh, the encouragement at the moment uh, and the adrenaline flowing in my system to try to do that and make a fool of myself. You never make a fool of yourself. You always sound great. There's always oh, I try. For me, it was never a precision or like or say it's it's the soul. You can feel uh, you know when musicians play with real real feel and groove and soul. So it's it's that's what audience and that's we as music lovers wanna hear and 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 see. That's why we're we're here. Um, you mentioned uh, two things that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, first yeah. one, you said that you played uh, lots of rockabilly. Uh, I mean, with that first band. Was that in the 50s or 60s? That was 50s. 50s. And what was the name of the band? It was Buzz Busby and Pete Pike. Okay. So that was, like, that, that was all slap for a couple hours. No, not every tune. but uh, Okay. They encouraged me to play slap bass because they were playing uh, with an electric guitar on most of the time. You know, even though Buzz Busby was well known in bluegrass circles as a mandolin player, when they played that gig, he was mostly playing electric guitar. So uh, it seemed appropriate with that uh, that I would try to make the sound of the bass and drums at the same time. So that's when I got into slapping, and I really haven't known much of it since then. Um, and, and who were your heroes back then? I read somewhere that you mentioned Bill Black as one of your, uh, one of the guys that you tried to emulate in your playing back in those days. Uh, I admired jazz players, although I had not tried to play it yet. Uh, my local bass playing hero was Keeter Betts. Keeter played regularly with the Charlie Bird Jazz Trio. He was also the favored bass player for, uh, I think, Ella Fitzgerald and other popular singers in the in the fifties, sixties, and seventies. Uh, Keeter was very successful as a as a recorded studio bassist and for a while he had his own jazz band and uh, i went to see him as much as i could and tried to get up and talk with him some but he was my bass playing jazz hero he but was the, not a slapper right i don't think he was a slapper at okay. all but uh, as far as slap bass players, who were you, your influences back back then? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> there was one who I admired, who was another local player around here. That was Jimmy Stoneman. Okay. Of the famous Stoneman family. Yes. Uh, they have a recording of an instrumental they call Haunted House. And he just has a, a, a very short slap bass solo in it. Uh, but you, you can tell this guy knows what he's doing. And uh, he, all of a sudden, out of nowhere comes this big, powerful noise. And, and that's a Jimmy on his bass. Uh, I like Jimmy's playing as well. And do you? He was, he was also, also local. Uh, I mean, local for you. He was also from D.C., right? He was, but I think like much of the family, he moved west. I don't know if he... Oh, I'm sorry. I know I that he di died in Smyrna, well, Tennessee, but I'm not he, sure not where he... Or, or Nashville or something. I don't know. I don't know where Jimmy went. Uh, you know, he had a terrible disease all of his life he he was epileptic oh 
and when the Stoneman family would be playing on stage, they could sense when Jimmy was about to have a seizure. And another member of the family would come over, take the bass, fill in for Jimmy. Jimmy would go off stage uh, until he got over his seizure. He'd come back and finish the show. So that's just a little personal. Wow, I didn't know that. Addition, I, just, Jimmy. I just studied his slap style. I didn't study his um, his personal life. But he, you know, for all of you that are not familiar, talking to our viewers now, that are not familiar with uh, Jimmy Stoneman, uh, definitely check out Stoneman Family. And also um, check, uh, check ch you can check him out uh, as part of the, um, uh, I think that they were, performing uh, uh, under Marty Robbins and Stonemans uh, on a TV. And they he played lots of slap stuff. I know that he played oh. uh, Five Little Johnson Girls. And then they played also um, with other other uh, um, uh, other country stars. And um, that he played also in the Johnny Cash's show, Country Gold, that he played Doing My Time with, with slap. And there's like, with Stoneman's, there are other songs, White Lightning, Orange Blossom Special, Orange Blossom Breakdown, oh. Wreck of the Old uh, 97. Uh, those are just some that come to my mind. But he was excellent slapper. I really like him. Uh, two, two names that, he, uh, uh, the, uh, one name that you haven't mentioned yet. And I remember that you mentioned that uh, 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 his name in that Bluegrass book. Uh, and actually, a couple a couple of people mentioned that, that that name, and that I'm not familiar with his slapping. So you might be able to help me out, like find um, uh, uh, find more about him, about Philip uh, Boucheret or Boucher, something like that. He was from uh, spasmodic bluegrass convulsion, and oh, I believe yeah. that, I believe that, that you said something in the lines that he was one of the best. Uh, slap bass players that you you've seen or heard or something like that. The French guy. Yes, you know I only saw him just during that one trip to France that I made with the scene. Would have been uh, sometime in the 1980s, and, and I never heard any more about him. Yeah, he was a good player. I'm not familiar with his playing. I'm familiar with his name because of you and because of uh, Marshall Wilburn. He also mentioned his name. And oh. because of that bluegrass book that that came out in, in the 80s or so. So that's the only reason why I know his name. And it actually took me a while to find like his whole name <laughs> because all of you guys like mentioned either Boucher or Philippe Boucher or something. So like, oh, who's this guy? I have to find his recordings or something. So uh, do you remember, have you heard any of his slapping uh, uh, on the recordings or it was only live shows? As far as I know, all I saw was the live show. Oh, okay. And obviously the guy had good chops. Uh, okay. Uh, he was a good bass player in general or not just slapper, right? Oh, yeah, in general as well. Okay. You know... Come to th it's coming back to me now. I think I think they did make a trip to the States. Uh, and I have some image in my head. It may be this Philippe fellow who uh, <laughs> at, at one point during the show, he put some sort of a strap around his bass fiddle and held it like a like a guitar or, or oh. like Mexican guitar own, uh, just just a, a novelty uh, stage routine. I think he's the one I saw doing that. It was a French. Okay. And, uh, I never heard him. I never seen him. I'm just familiar with his name because of you guys. But I was wondering, you know, if you had any recommendation. But another. Another name that you briefly mentioned uh, is Ed Ferris, who's uh, who was also an excellent slap bass player, and I believe he was the guy that that played uh, in Country Gentleman right after you, right? That's right. Okay. I had recommended him to be my replacement. Oh, cool. I had to 
talk Duffy into giving him a chance. <laughs> but uh, apparently Duffy liked him because Ed stayed there for a good uh, eight or nine years, longer than yeah. I did. Oh, really? I I, uh, I think that he stayed until, uh, well, until May 1969. <laughs> oh, okay. It wasn't as long then as I thought it was. Okay. That's, that's what I read, you know, like somewhere. Yeah. That, that's what I remembered. And um, no. I know that, that after he left Country Gentleman, he joined uh, Cliff Waldron band or Shades of Grey or something like that. And then okay. yeah, other yeah. bands. Ed and I both played in uh, several of the same bands. Uh, there were some events where uh, at a festival they would bring uh, two, maybe three bands together on stage at the same time. Mm -hmm. and I remember at one of those uh, jam bands, jammed together bands, uh, Ed and I both had to play Little Darwin Pal of Mine. So uh, I was not the good slapper. I said, I'm just going to pick notes. I'm just going to play a melody thing and let Ed have it. He can he can slap like Jake. He, he knows the Jake lick much better than I do. But it's funny. Yeah. Uh, when Ed took my job uh, with the gentleman, I tried to teach him the bass intro line to uh, Night Walk. It's Eddie Edcock's instrumental. He tunes his banjo down in a G minor chord, uh, and it has a bass intro to it. And Ed says, I can get, I can understand the notes you're playing, but I can't get that. My fingers or the right hand just don't work like yours do. But Ed didn't have to. Ed chose his notes very well and was always very popular. Uh, played for years with Don Reno and, uh, and, and Bill Harrell. <laughs> Ed and I were the best of friends. We would drink beer together. We'd eat crabs. We'd listen to our record collections of the Blue Sky Boys. We both love those sweet harmonies of the Blue Sky Boys. Ed and I were very good friends. And when we heard that our hero, George Shuffler, had just joined Bill Harrell's band, we went to the local nightclub to sit in the audience and, and, and listen to them. <laughs> Ed and I were George's uh, <laughs> cheerleaders, uh, so much so that Bill Harrell got angry at us. He said, you people are supposed to be here to listen to me sing. But every time George would play something fancy on the bass, uh, Ed and I would nudge each other and say, pick it, George. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, Ed, no, we what, what, as bass, bass players are not often, you know, the stars of the show, but sometimes we should be, right? <laughs> we should be. You know, to this day, I like to befriend the bass players in other bands. We can talk our base talk, uh, and I just like to get to know them. Well, I definitely enjoy talking base with you, and I really enjoyed like when you came to my show with my old band, Fish Tank Ensemble, when I played DC five, six, seven years ago or something. Yeah. Hopefully, this whole apocalypse is going to stop soon, so we can you know start touring again, and then. Stop, start coming back to DC and hang out with you again. Uh, um, uh -huh. We don't know. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned that you were good friends with Ed, um, and I I think that he played two domestic strings, right? He played Golden Spiral G and D and uh, A and E domestic, right? Yes, uh, he and I both started with the Golden Spirals about the same time, and, and a lot mm -hmm. of others uh, started using them as well. And he had to convince me that I should get rid of those gut E and A strings and just put a steel one on there because the, uh, the lower strings in the gut set didn't have the strength that the upper 
strings did. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would always want to get the, the steel string that had lost its uh, metallic twang. Uh, once they get old and they've lost that edge, they're easier to match with the gut sound. Yeah, I know. I actually do like domestic strings, and I play domestic strings, and yeah. I've been working with them for, uh, for I don't know, for kind of a long time. And then a few years ago, they offered me a new prototype, which was made for people allergic to nickel. And oh. um, they sound, when they told me, hey, you know, uh, uh, we would like you to try these strings, because they're, they sound like slightly less metallic, but they're kind of like a spire core. And I was like, yeah, I would like to try them out. And um, ever since they gave me the first set, they've been making, you know, a couple sets per year, like for me, and I've been playing those strings and I love them. Uh, and I've been trying to convince them to make those strings, you know, available for public, but uh, I don't know, they either think that it's, it's, it's not going to be... Um, there's not going to be much interest or I don't know. I'll, I'll still try to convince them because I'm sure that lots of people would love to play them because they're exactly what lots of people want. They're like spiral core, but less metallic. So, well, you know, I, I, oh, yeah, several times I've, I've put sets of, uh, of either Tomastics or Jargars or the, Dario steel strings, what do they call them? Helicores. And every time it just bugs me uh, to have to play on them. What I do is harder to play when the tension on the strings is greater than what I'm used to. It limits what I can do with it. And when I go back to my gut string, I think, you know, they're not as loud as your steel strings. But they don't have to be, you know. We're usually playing either through a, a with a pickup or into a, into an amp or with a microphone into a, a house sound system, so we don't have to be the loudest thing on stage. Now, a good friend of mine had a, a good uh, take on uh, alternate steel strings, uh, Billy Budd the bass player in a band called East of Monroe uh, was showing me his bass. And he always gets loud volume out of his bass. He said, instead of the standard set, he uses the solo set. So his steel strings are a gauge lighter than the standard, but he tunes them to a standard pitch. So he likes that and that, that gives him a loud instrument. Yeah, lots of people actually use that 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 uh, that style. Like, so play solo strings. Uh, if you guys are not familiar, those solo strings those are used for a classical music for uh, solo concertos. Yeah. Classical musicians usually have those, and those are tuned to uh, A, E, B, and F sharp. Yes. Um, and so basically, whole step up. Yes, uh, but like often, you know, roots bass players use those strings and just tune them, tune them down, use their uh, regular tuning, and that way they can get, uh, um, they, they can j just play in in a band. And they're not uh, be, uh, bass is not transposable instrument anymore, so it's just a regular, regular yeah. bass. Uh, so, did lots of bluegrass bass players use those strings back then, or that was kind of like a unique thing? Well, I, I don't know any other bass players who use that kind oh, okay. of I, I don't know. Uh, we we got like some comments here. George Welling, he mentioned, great to hear Ed Ferris mentioned, a real champ. We no, all agree with that. Uh, Marshall Wilborn was also here. He said um, he had to leave. But Marshall, you're going to have a chance like to, to, to watch us again. Like so that... This show lives on YouTube forever, so please share it. Um, so it seems that everybody's really happy that that, that you're here, Tom. Oh, good. Uh, uh, Stephen, who he oh, Stephen. mentioned, yeah. Keter Betts as one of uh, uh, DC's finest bass players. That's true. Yes. Uh, he said that, uh, or oh, George Welling, he mentioned Keter was also in the house band at Blues Alley. Uh -huh. You see, I'm not familiar with him, so maybe I should check him out. We got some comments from Serbia as well. 
so races on when you played races on everybody loved it oh. um mark rubin you see lots of people are watching oh good uh, mark rubin said like holy cow e to g george is my hero too George. and um, <laughs> talking about george's tuning yeah like you know i i might like to try that it's kind of sounds interesting but no, you know no. i'm like i'm no, not yeah. sure you're how i think it's really hard lines. for me yeah. to get rid e and f and f sharp you and need jm those. total uh i'm sorry i'm not sure how to pronounce your last name what bell or something he wrote did i miss any string talk uh you might have missed some string talk but as i mentioned this show lives this episode gonna live on youtube forever so make sure to watch it again and um you're gonna you, you can find out about it and um all right so like lots of positive comments for the seldom scene roll on tom great <laughs> some emoticons oh um, <laughs> my daughter and so, all. <laughs> so please guys like keep commenting we are checking live chat if you have any questions for tom Please do that, and I will highlight your question, and Tom or me, I'll, we will answer. Okay. Um, do you uh, did you want to play anything else? How do you feel? Can I play? I can probably play something else. Let me. Uh, were you planning on to? Like you mentioned that you had like a few uh, songs, but. Okay, another jazz tune that bluegrass players like to play. And I did put a bass solo in an album that we did as the Country Gentleman Reunion Band uh, was with Eddie Adcock, Jimmy Goodrow, and Randy Waller. Uh, we did uh, Sweet Georgia Brown. Let me pick that one. Oh. That's great. I love that tune. It, it was also. Um, I don't. I, I normally don't play slap on that tune, but it came to me. Hey, this will be a good one for it. We could. It works well. It works well. Yeah, it's it's. A, I heard that tune uh, played in the gypsy jazz style a lot, and then slap always sounds great in that I'm style. Not surprised. It, it would be good for that. Yes, absolutely. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, Terry. Uh, Wittenberg, he wrote Grandfather's Clock, uh, oh. Terry. We already played Grandfather's Clock. So when we're done with this live stream, um, just play it from the beginning and you're going to be able to hear Grandfather's Clock. Okay. Um, I wanted to, to, to mention something about Grandfather's Clock. You recorded that song uh, twice, right? You recorded for, with both uh, Country Gentleman and Sel Seldom Scene. Yes, and I, I think that with seldom seen, you played a little bit more slap, right? Yes, I did. A, a little longer slap. Uh, 
like I mentioned earlier, sometimes I'll start into a slap solo and I begin to lose the energy. I can't keep it up forever like you can. Uh, and I'm sure that's what happened in uh, those both both of those recordings of Grandfather's Clock were from live concerts. And once you start into something on stage, you never know exactly how you're going to get out of it. You can start out playing it a certain way and uh, maybe it'll come through OK, maybe it won't. And, and, and Terry, next time we play in a jam session, don't make me play that damn clock. <laughs> Terry is a good buddy. We, we go to jam sessions and uh, we we used to play in a new grass band. We had a good time with that. Now we just jam in the backyard. And bluegrass is such a fun music. I, I, I love playing it and I don't have a like, chance like, to play it that often, but I always enjoy, especially when there are some good high skilled pickers. So. <laughs> It's good. When I moved to San Francisco, which was the first city that I moved in the States uh, to, uh, after I moved from uh, Serbia, from Europe, like most first couple of years, I played mostly bluegrass. Uh -huh. It was fun. You know, I, I still enjoy playing it a lot, but I don't get a chance to play it often. But So you I'm hung out with in my fingers. Lewis and Kathy Kalik and uh, well, there's a lot of pickers uh, and Yes, lots of pickers in San Francisco. Every band in, in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, Lot, lots of like, so I met them all, you know, with well. most of them I played and jammed and there was some good, uh, good, uh, good, uh, really good, good players and good jams as well. I think that some of those are going on for decades. Oh, um, and let yeah, me I mean, ask you a question. Then. You've been to San Francisco, you're a bass player. Uh, you, you do you know Lisa Burns, the bass player? I don't think so. Lisa, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Two years ago, uh, with the Valerie Smith band, I played at the uh, uh, the Father's Day festival at uh, Grass Valley, California. They have a music camp running for a week before the festival, and uh, they had me as a bass instructor. And Lisa, bless her heart, said, I'm going to be your assistant and I'm going to provide you a bass so you don't have to fly with one. Would you prefer a plywood or a card bass? I said, gosh, you mean beggars can be choosers? Yeah, uh, so not, yeah, yeah she had her selection of uh, collection of basses. And uh, during the music camp, she and I hosted a jam session of country gentleman songs. There are so many good songs that people have learned from the gentleman and, uh, and it was so good to play them with Lisa and, and Patrick uh, and uh, other California people. I just thought in San Francisco, you must have met her in jamming circles. I met lots of people, in bluegrass people in San Francisco, especially, I mean, and there was that uh, Strictly Bluegrass Festival and then Hardly Strictly, Strictly Bluegrass yeah. Festival. So there's, I think that the bluegrass scene in San Francisco was fairly big back in those days, back when, when I moved there, which was 2004, 2005, like, you know, okay. I moved out. I was going down to LA, it was 2008 or something. Oh, gosh. No, later on, 2010. I was there for six or seven years. Okay. Um, yeah, 2006. I'm sure I played Hardly Strictly Festival with Emmy New Harris. Oh, I was there. I saw you. And I would, I played the uh, the Eminence bass. Oh, okay. The, the small one? Person sound crew who traveled with her. And they preferred that I use the Eminence rather than the Fat acoustic bass well you know the eminence still sounds great just like an acoustic it is it sounds pretty good yeah a hollow body acoustic instrument it's just skinny and it looks like an upright electric uh but anyway. and what was the reason for that were they uh preferring that because of the feedback 
I think they could control the sound better. They did okay. all the overtones. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, I played there two years with Emmy Lou, and before that, several years with uh, Hazel Dickens. Okay. Yeah, that was a good festival. Probably this year, not going to happen, but you know, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? We have this slap stream uh, to fulfill all the slap needs. Um, so besides the country gentleman, you mentioned country gentleman, you mentioned uh, seldom seen, you mentioned Emily Harris, uh, like who are the, some other bands like that you play or band leaders that you played with uh, that you would like to, to mention so that people can check out the recordings or? or um... Well, I've been fortunate enough to have played at least a few days with many of the masters in bluegrass, including <laughs> Bill Monroe, uh, including Earl Scruggs, although I didn't play with Lester, I, I did get to play a prominent show with Earl in his later years. Uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> I met Jimmy Martin many times, and he kept saying, I want you in my band. I said, well, okay, I can do that. But then the more I thought about it, the more I, thought, I don't think I could get along with that guy. He's a very intense and it would be hard to take. And so I made demands about how much money I had to make to play with him. And he said, no, 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 I don't need you. <laughs> I don't need to pay you $300 a day. I can get somebody here for a hundred. So, oh. so I, I, I didn't, so I, I did play with Jimmy in the studio. Uh, I did play at least three shows with the Stanley brothers. Oh, wow. They used to travel when it was hard times. They couldn't carry a whole band. They would pick up a bass player when they went places. And so um, on at least three occasions, I, I did play with the Stanley Brothers. Um, and another one was so rewarding uh, to get to play with Jesse McReynolds. What a hoss he is. Uh, I had filled in one show when it was still Jim and Jesse, uh, but then after his brother Jim passed away, and of course, Jesse continued on for a long time. Uh, I, I played uh, three different venues here in the East when, uh, when Jesse came this way. And I tell you, in music, it doesn't get any better than to play El Comanchero with Jesse McReynolds and Alan Shelton. Alan played that uh, beautiful kind of bouncy style on, on the banjo. Um, that was such a, such a great part of Jim and Jesse's sound for a long time. And he returned to Jesse's band in later years. Uh, I got, I got to play with them at a festival in Virginia, then another one in New Jersey. It was a, a, a great thing to play with those cool people. I bet. I mean, there were, you have like some great experiences. And as far as recordings, which were recordings would you recommend for people that are in general interested in your bass playing and your slap bass playing? If you had to choose five, ten, whatever, you know, like so, what what would you say that represents your style the best? A, a good sample of, of the stuff that I have recorded that, that I would recommend for people. The uh, uh, live at the cellar door album, which has the better version of Grandfather's Clock, and. Uh, the Country Gentleman Reunion Band with the uh, Sweet Georgia Brown. Uh, I have my own instrumental, uh, actually with, with words that I actually sing on Valerie's latest album. I named my bass Bessie. 
the famous female bluegrass boy was Bessie Lee Walden, who was playing with Bill Monroe the first time I ever saw Bill and many later times. And so, you know, lots of guys named their bases after women, so I named my name Bessie. And I have the name Bessie uh, uh, inlaid on the tailpiece on my face. And so any of you people come see me during the show, I'll be glad to show you my uh, Bessie tailpiece. Uh, I have my tune that I call Bessie's Tune that I play and sing on Valerie's album. Uh, gosh, what's the name of that Valerie's album? <laughs> but it, it's the latest album of Valerie Smith on Bell Buckle recordings. Uh, I've got my tune on that. Come uh, listen to that. Uh, and as far as my slap playing, the, the, when I gave it, all I had was in the uh, seldom seen recording of Tennessee Blues. I can't remember exactly which album that is on, but I'm sure if you search for it, you can find Tennessee Blues by the seldom seen. I do that. Oh, and another one. Oh, yeah. Some people say what I did was iconic. I've got to talk to you about my famous intro to Ryder. Okay, now with Seldom Seen, we did I Know You, Ryder. Uh, my intro. That's all there is to it, but um, you <laughs> you need that next play rider. It sounds cool. I like it. Uh, I used to make it a little harder when I recorded it. I had more slides in it that uh, became harder to do as we gradually started playing it faster on stage, uh, and I realized that all those slides that were hard to do are just some uh, cerebral stuff that really no one cares about whether they hear it or not. So it's easier to just pull it off. It's, uh, I, I used to slide off of the B flat note. But I, I just pull it off. I love I love those pull offs and glissandos and slides in bluegrass music. I was talking a lot about it with Marshall Wilburn because he's using that. And if you guys missed that episode, please check it out. I believe it was um, third episode or something, um, and it was the first bluegrass episode in this in this series of the slap stream. So check it out. Uh, um, and. Um, any any other bass players that was using those slides and pull offs that you remember? It's hard to think of samples right now, but you, you mentioned Marshall, and uh, I, of course I enjoyed your interview with Marshall, which I watched here a few days ago. Uh, I love Marshall's slap bass solo in Lady of Spain. I yes. kept waiting for him to play that when he was on your show. And uh, I think he was playing some other things. But uh, if people want to get some recordings of good slap bass, get Marshall playing Lady of Spain. I love that version. It's great. Um, I wanted to ask, oh, one thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, when you were talking about Tennessee Blues and Seldom Seen, was that from the album Act 4 or something else? It probably was. I don't know. Okay. I look at my records and see. Oh, you don't. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't. Want, I could go in the other room and and look it yeah, up. Yeah, don't worry about it. Like people have Google, they can they can find out about it. Uh, uh, we have another question for you, and it's from uh, uh, Brad Gladstone, and he asked you, "Have you ever played with Danny Gatton? He was another DC guy <laughs> and bluegrass." 
he loved playing bluegrass. But I, I believe he was more like rockabilly and jazz guy, a little less bluegrass. But he had some bluegrass chops. That's that guy a, could have played anything. A question regarding uh, our local people here around the D.C. area. Uh, I never played with Danny Gatton, but at times when I couldn't make a date at the Birchmere with Seldom Seen, they would get Danny Gatton with his electric bass to come fill in for me. So I would like to hear what he did with it, but I never heard it. Of course, I wasn't there. Uh, I had seen Danny with his rockabilly, and I had that image of him with a big old amplifier with a Ford engine label on it as if it was a pickup truck. Uh, that's my image of, of Danny Gatton. But no, I never played with Danny. He was such an amazing player. He that guy could could you know could play and pick any tune, could play any style. So Brad, that was a good question, Brad. Please keep them coming. I'm not sure, you know, we've been already doing this for almost two hours. So okay. if you guys have like any questions like for Tom or me, now's the time. Yeah, Danny and, sub a and, couple of times. Go yeah, ahead. With my sub a couple of times. That's amazing. Are there any recordings with Danny Gatton playing uh, bass guitar in your bands? I don't believe so. No. Oh, okay. That was not very, uh, there was no YouTube back in those days that, that saw that every show was on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I would love, that, would, that would be interesting to see because I, I know that he loved bluegrass and then he, when he played guitar, well, that's good. He, he used lots of bluegrass licks uh and jazz and rockabilly or like blues he created kind of his own style uh, his own fusion such an amazing definitely one of the best musicians um are there any other slab bass players that you 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 would like to mention um as your contemporaries or your influences or people that you appreciate now that play slab well you know of course, we always loved Roger Bush, you know, who who played a, a slap and style bass with the Country Gazette, and before that, they were Kentucky Colonels, uh, and that was in the day, like we had mentioned, that most bluegrass bass players did not slap, but Roger did. So I liked Roger, uh, got to know him whenever we wound up on the same venue uh which was not very often but uh, I, I did like roger uh, i can't think of uh, any more that we haven't already discussed yeah, yeah it's kind of hard like to find like especially bluegrass musicians that played played slap i mean junior husky would be one of them and no, i believe that bob moore played uh some bluegrass as well with slapping um yeah, both famous for what they did and of course roy husky uh, yeah a famous bass player uh, and i think roy would play slap uh in solos, uh, I'm not aware that he actually would accompany people playing that way. I, I don't know. I saw Roy when uh, he toured with Emmy Lou Harris's band. Oh gosh, her hot band that at the time it had Roy Husky, it had Jerry Douglas, and it had Sam Bush. That was a good band. Oh, hey, and, and uh, one that I'm happy of, if people want to look up some recordings, look up the live appearance of Emmy Lou Harris at the Derby Club in Los Angeles. It would have been in the year 2007. I was playing my eminence bass. Mike Aldridge was there with his dobro. Ricky Simpkins 
was playing fiddle and mandolin, uh, and Keith Little, another good California person, was in the band for that show. Uh, my relationship in Emmy's band began when she learned that John Starling had finally retired from his medical practice and was ready to sing again. She always loved to sing with John Starling. So since uh, we had formed a band called John Starling and Carolina Star, that was Ricky and Mike and me and Jimmy Goodrow uh, and John Starling, we became Emmy's band. She said, I'd like you people to be my band for acoustic venues. Can you do that for me? Uh, so we wound up playing every single show she did for two years. And that was a good gig while it lasted. <laughs> she needed somebody younger and more hip than, than, than us. She kept Ricky and let the rest of us go. Uh, John Starling had medical problems that kept him from flying. That's why at that event that made the good video in uh, the Derby Club, that Starling was not there, but the band backing up Emmy that night was basically uh, John Starling's Carolina Star, but without John Starling. Uh, the good videos there, you should uh, hear Emmy and Mike and, and me with the eminent space. These are all great suggestions, you know, there's lots of homework for all of us like to check out on YouTube or Spotify or vinyl. Um, right. One thing that I wanted to ask you, since you're talking about all these gigs that you 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 had, some of those are really big names like Emily Harris and Country Gentleman and Seldom Seen. Um, like, I, what would be your advice? Uh, to younger, uh, younger bass players, how, how do you get a gig? You know, not many of us have an opportunity to get a major gig, major uh, national or international touring act. Um, what would be, what was the best way that you were getting gigs back then? And what is the best way, in your opinion, to get gigs now? Well, the, to get started getting gigs, you should just attend a lot of jam sessions and let people hear you and uh, uh, do the best you can to uh, support people. Now, as a bass player, it's your job to make the star in front of you sound better. Sometimes that means you better not show off your own chops. You just support them in whatever makes them sound the best. And if you're lucky, maybe they'll give you a solo somewhere along the way. Uh, but that's a hard lesson to learn because people learn their art and they want to show what they can do with it. Uh, I was lucky when I was young that I was with some bands that were very willing to let me show off even when it was in poor taste. Uh, a lot of what I did back in my days with the gentleman, I was overplaying, which I admit right now, but uh, John Duffy always encouraged me to do more, bless his heart. Uh, but uh, for young people starting out, don't count on your show off being welcomed, uh, support whoever you're playing with, uh, jam with people, get to know people, get to know uh, the musicians who are playing with bands out on the professional circuit. Uh, and if they have confidence in what you can do, you just might be recommended for gigs coming up. That's how I got it. You know, I, when I was 18 years old, I got to play with Bill Monroe as a side temporary Bill in. I got to play with Bill Clifton, uh, and that has turned into a lifetime friendship. Uh, I played with Bill on uh, perhaps a dozen of his recordings since then. 
but uh, I had jammed with and sat in with John Duffy before I had ever joined the Country Gentleman. And uh, John told Bill Clifton, who was booking shows and putting together bands, he said, I've got this young fellow who's good with the bass. Can I bring him along? And so I got that gig. That's the kind of thing to do when you're looking for people to play with. So it was mostly jam sessions and then people would hear you play and then invite you and then, you know, kind of um, word of mouth type of thing. Yeah. No ads or something like that. I don't know what was back oh. then. Now it's, you I know, know, Instagram and Facebook and Craigslist or whatever. I don't know if that would help or not. You know, I, I never tried that. But okay. <laughs> Yeah, I always like to ask the, the, that question because that's the question that I'm getting like from, um, you know, my fans. And then they ask me, how did you get that gig? How and then it's it's kind of hard to explain. But, you know, I'm curious to hear other uh, successful bass player stories. How did they get the gigs? And then uh, I'm glad you shared yours. Mm -hmm. um, since we're talking about advices and um, and mistakes, what would be your advice to other bass players um, like about uh, about learning to play in a band to learn to play bass and common mistakes that you, uh, you you would like to avoid if you have if you had a if you could have uh, if you can uh, if, if you could give advice to younger young Tom Gray, what would you say? I would advise bass players who have learned the standard of playing the one and five in every chord, uh, explore notes that you can play that will lead you to the next chord. You know, you should still fill that role of playing the one note on the one beat that gives the whole band something firm to stand on. But you have choices of notes that you can play leading up to those. Uh, experiment with things that, that work for you. Uh, chromatically going up or down, uh, or even it doesn't have to be chromatic, but you can just be. I like to put together a bass line playing scales if I can choose notes that will make me wind up on the one chord of the next chord before you get there. Uh, you know, you, you can do that. Let me, uh, you can make music sound a lot more interesting and have some dynamics of going somewhere. You know, lots of, Bluegrass players will play uh, Bill Monroe's tune, uh, Roanoke. Roanoke has an A part that almost all stays in the in the one chord in the G, uh, and, and then uh, the B part of it uh, goes through the, the four and five chord. But uh, you can be playing long, long scales in that. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna hum like I'm a fiddle. By doing that, you are uh, you, you are showing where the music is going. You're winding up on the one note of the next chord when you uh, when you need to be there, and uh, people listening, people playing with you, can feel the energy of the music moving. Uh, work those things out. Put Bessie back down on the floor.
I always love those bass runs, bass runs that you're doing. Oh. It's uh, they're not uh, super common in bluegrass. At least they were not before you started playing bluegrass. I, I feel that you you made your own mark with your bass lines. Um, an another question, I have to get back to slap a little bit. Uh, what would be the most essential slap bass recordings that you heard, not not where you play, like from other people? That you do you have anything in mind that you could I don't know. mention? You know, I really don't do the slapping well enough to give good advice. You, you can probably give much better advice than I can. Uh, I try to analyze what I hear people doing and use as much of it as I am physically able to do. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, as far as you know, what advice to give people. Uh, yeah, something that I I had always wondered about when you slap, you tuck you tuck your thumb under, or you put your thumb up. I, I, I realized, hey, you better get your thumb up and out of the way. Is, is that is that correct? Um, On your right some, some people play like with these two fingers. I think most of the people I usually play with 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 uh, these two. Oh, and then so that way. Um, <laughs> If I play like this, if I want to do double stops, then I just do this, so I don't change my position on my um, wrist. And but sometimes I go if I have to do like fast psychobilly lines uh, or punk lines, then I do these three, these two fingers. Uh, for most of the groove stuff, it's uh, it's uh, so. But you have you got a, another uh, comment from Bethany Gresser. Tom, you're awesome. Now, and you, we know that Tom is awesome. There's a reason why he's, here, why he's here with us. You bring up the, the use of, of which fingers. Uh, something I try to emphasize when I'm doing a bass workshop. Learn to pick with three fingers. Your index finger, your middle finger, and your ring finger. Uh, if all of those fingers can be used, uh, if you pick a note with the ring finger, your other fingers are in position to immediately play more notes. Uh, if you have to keep coming back with the same one or two fingers, it slows you down. Uh, you know, I could do it and uh, demonstrate it. It's probably getting a little too technical. That's a great technique, like with, with the three fingers and one that really mastered it um it's a is a jazz player uh niles orsted patterson he was the guy that played great like three finger technique and he was really fast he was able to play all those kind of like a saxophone line so he when he played with joe pass he was playing was able to play unisono with with him um amazing bass player really really like uh like his style um Okay, guys, like so, so we're getting close to the end. Now it's like two hours and five minutes. Oh, and so now's the time that I would like to, to see where's everybody from. Please let me know in the live chat. And um, if you have any questions for Tom or me, now's the time because we're close to the end. Um, I have just a couple more questions for Tom, but if you have more questions, now's the time to ask that. Okay, uh, so you're gonna. If you don't you, you're gonna lose your chance if you don't do it now um pass them on yeah i, I don't see those questions on my screen but, but you can uh, i see a few comments that come up uh, uh, yeah yeah like the, I, I i can see them you know there are people are commenting on youtube as a on a side live chat and then i'm highlighting some of those uh oh one question that we did not answer comes from fernando slap oh uh, what Fernando is, is one of the guys that it's actually is helping me out with this. He did all these slaptastic graphics. So wow. he's the reason why uh, Slapstream looks so good. He did the that's intro video. He did the, the graphics when it says like your name, my name, and all that, all that fun stuff. Uh, that thank you, Fernando. 
Uh, so he has the question, in those days without gigs, I assume in these days without gigs, which exercise do you do? Scales, songs, or do you do anything like that, like to keep all you chopped up? All of the above. I like to play melodies of tunes that perhaps I've never tried to play before. Yeah, uh, I'll sing it to myself, uh, try to play it just, just to uh, uh, challenge myself to uh, interpret what I hear. I like to know what note is being sung by somebody because sometimes that affects the notes you choose to play on the bass. You don't want to step on someone's toes, uh, but you want to support them. Uh, uh, I would play a few scales, but then I like to play some jazz tunes. Uh, some of those, uh, like some that I, I just just played here earlier today, the Alabama Jubilee or uh, Sweet Georgia Brown, uh, Sunrise, uh, all of those. Uh, you know, I used to play in a Dixieland jazz band, which was a lot of fun uh, with all that. similarities. Uh, oh, yeah, we were a band called Federal Jazz Commission. Hmm. I was in that band for 15 years, and we recorded at least a dozen albums. And uh, they gave me lots of solos. I, can, I can't think of what they all were, but every recording that the band made were all live in the nightclub where we played gosh what we had a regular tuesday night gig and we just played all the standard uh louis armstrong louis armstrong i must say uh our band leader said uh, louis deserves more respect than to be called louis <laughs> hey yes sir okay. uh we played a lot of louis armstrong tunes uh and I would try to play those. And if I knew any words, I would sing them. Uh, if not, I would just try to play them. Uh, and and uh, likewise, you know, bluegrass or country standards, you know, I love old country music. Uh, I, I like old Marty Robbins songs. I like Hank Thompson songs. I would want to just stand there and play and sing some of those just by myself and play a solo in it, even though I will probably never get called to play a solo in those tunes on a stage. But if I'm just standing around my own living room, I like to play those melodies when I can. And it's fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, those, I feel that those, especially early jazz and, 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 uh, and gypsy jazz and bluegrass kind of can kind of interact in between each other because you can play all those songs in any of these styles. And I think it sounds great. Like, especially if you play jazz songs, like bluegrass style yeah. or, or a yeah. bluegrass song, like jazz style or, or gypsy jazz style. It sounds, it sounds yeah. fun. It sounds a little bit different, but fun. Yes. They are all a very traditional kind of music, but with room to improvise. Yes. It's good for, for pickers. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one question that we that I haven't asked you is about your gear uh, outside of um, besides bass and strings. You mentioned strings. You mentioned bass. Uh, yeah. Is there? Do you have your favorite pickup? Do you have your favorite yeah. amp or microphone? Yes. I use the realist pickup. It's kind of a nuisance to install it on the bass, but it really sounds better than others that I've tried. If I'm traveling, I always carry a spare, uh, oh gosh, what's the pickup is the clip on <laughs> Fishman. I always carry a Fishman because it can very quickly be installed on any bass and, and you'll be in business right away. Uh, yeah just as a spare, but I prefer the tone of the realist pickup. Yeah, David Gage's uh, uh, realist is very, very acoustic. It sounds uh, very acoustic, yeah. Most gigs that I play, I do use an amp, 
and I use the briefcase amp by Phil Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I bought it at a rock and roll club and they said, well, this amp is just a practice amp. You're going to need something bigger for the stage. <laughs> I said, well, I'm just playing with an acoustic bluegrass band. I think this will do for me. So I usually turn it up to about 60% of its volume. When I loaned it to someone playing electric in a bluegrass band, they turn it up all the way. Uh, but it's it's powerful enough for me, and it does sound acoustic. Uh, you know, I'm not very up on technical equipment. Uh, mics, there's a Norman mic that has always sounded good, and I, I, I don't know the numbers of them. Uh, and I think the placement in a studio when you're recording is more important than the mic itself. I'll get the best tone uh, putting the mic between the bridge and the treble F hole. Okay. Sometimes they want to get uh, multiple mics and have one maybe up high to get string noise and maybe a, another one down low to get more bottom. But, uh, so you would use that uh, microphone up high, like even if you're not slapping? Yes. Yeah. Okay. For the string uh, noise. Okay. I use I, one, one microphone usually pointing out the fingers, but mostly for slapping. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think if I were slapping, I, I would want something up high to, to get get all the clackety clack on the on yes. the board. Uh, when I'm just playing for notes, I want to get a fat, sweet tone. I don't want a lot of finger noise. Yeah. So that's why I just want the mic on the wood. Uh yeah, that sounds good. Well, I think that we're. Any more questions? Uh, I have one more question. I have a. I wanted to ask you something. Um, whenever I see you play, you feel very enthusiastic about it, and then you really seem to love what you're doing. That you really love bass, you really love music, you really yeah. love bluegrass, I and I want to ask you, like, what's that that it's still inspiring you? That it's this inspiring you like to still do what you're doing, which is playing and touring and, and, you know, just being a musician, being a bass player. Well, I, I think all of those things bring inspiration and, uh, you know, Hey, at, at my age, I want to prove to myself and to the world that I can still do it. Oh. So, I'm, I'm, I'm still at it. Uh, and I do like to put together a bass line. Like I said, find an alternate way to get to the one note of the next chord on the one beat when you're landing on it. Okay. That's a, that's a good answer. You know, we all want to do uh, when we grow up what you're doing now. So it's 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 always the goal, just like to be that happy and that still enthusiastic about music and and you know to to do to still be able to to do a good solid bass groove, what you're doing. And I want to thank you for that. And I'm sure that all our viewers. Would like to thank you for that as well. I hope Is so. there anything else that you would like to mention? Like I think we're about the end. Two hours and fifteen minutes. We, oh. we had a pretty good run. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Listen to me uh, all the time. Uh, nobody left. Everybody's still here. You know, I'm sure that they would listen to you for another two hours. You know, I would. You know, but I I ran out of the questions and I don't want to. You know, like um, I think. It was enough. Like I, I found out everything I wanted to 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 know. But and uh, I wonder if there's anything that you wanted to mention. Okay. Hey, let me tell you one more little story about right. about this bass, Bessie. Uh, I've been asked to play because 
people said, I like the sound of that bass. I wonder, uh, I want you to play on my record. Uh, well, I loaned this bass to the uh, people in the studio. It was J.D. Crow and his New South. They were recording that famous album, uh, one of the few albums that's only known by its record number. Everybody knows album 0044. It's the great album of, of the New South. They had recorded it in a studio in Silver Spring, Maryland, near me. They had borrowed Ed Ferris's bass to make the recordings. Uh, they had two more songs to record for the album. And uh, Ed was going to be taking his bass away. So uh, someone in the band came to me and said, could we borrow your bass for the last two songs on the album? So I said, oh, sure. So I, I gave him my bass to use. And uh, when I went there to the studio to retrieve my bass, they said, we liked the way it sounded so much. We replaced the bass tracks on the whole album. So when you hear that uh, album, that's my Bessie on there. It's being played by Bobby Sloan, who plays left-handed. Oh. But he got good sound out of it. It's wow. Obviously, since they, since they okay. replaced the whole bass, that's interesting. So you, he played left-handed, but regular tuning, or he he moved the strings he he left it tuned right-handed oh played, okay but he you know he picked with his left fretted with his right he did the same thing when he played the fiddle sometimes oh, he oh, okay. fiddle in that band he was a better bassist than he was a fiddle player so uh on that album uh they had ricky skaggs playing fiddle and bobby sloan played the bass he played yeah, five bass right. Left-handed, and he played. He played Bessie. That's cool. Uh, we haven't mentioned that Ed Ferris. He, his bass was called Margaret, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. This was have Mark, ever, have, honest, Bessie. Have you ever played Margaret? Yes, I did. Okay. Was it a good bass? Yes, it was. Uh, Margaret was a Pullman bass. Yes. Uh, top of the line, a very expensive bass. Ed's father had recently passed away. Ed had inherited some money and he went to the violin shop and, and bought their most expensive carved bass. And it was that Pullman bass. Mm. Uh, but, you know, it was so powerful that it was hard to record. I'm sure you've had that kind of experience. Uh, to yes. get clean recording, you don't want too many overtones. That bass was very rich and full, and it was a killer when you played it on stage or if you played it in a jam out on a field somewhere. Uh, it was a killer bass. Uh, yeah, classical classical instruments uh, tend to sound very loud, uh, but they're not the best choice for for the roots players, because roots players don't like, I mean, most of us like use a pickup. So and then when you have like a very loud acoustic instrument, it's kind of just makes more problems. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's the reason why m most of the people, I guess, play old K's and plywood bases. Oh, okay. I think so. Well, that's my little, one of my little bass stories about Bessie. Uh, on someone else's album in which she That's was great. she was never credited <laughs> it was bobby sloan playing it yeah that that's good to know that's yeah. good to know all right tom i want to thank you so much for sure. being with us for two thank hours you. and 20 minutes oh wow wow okay and this i will this, see you this. in person someday I, I sure hope so. I sure hope so that, you know, we all going to start touring soon and go back to normal, normal, not to new normal. Back to normal. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's got to happen, you know, soon. All right. Thanks so much. And I wish you all the best. And thanks so much for doing this. And um, 
I hope to see you soon. All right. Toward DC or when you come like to the West Coast. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, guys. That was two hours and twenty minutes. So thanks so much for all of us, for all of you that's been with us for such a long time. But I I, I feel that you kind of got used to it, you know, because we had some interviews that were even like over three hours long, but none of them were like shorter than two. I want to thank you so much for that. Um, I want to thank all the people that are supporting us for all the donations. If you feel so inclined, like to help me out, like continue doing these uh, slap streams. I put down a few links um, uh, down below in the descript description of this video. You have PayPal and Venmo and you have Patreon. So please check out Patreon because that's the one that it's really helping us out. And you got like, so you can get some cool perks from me uh, for doing that, for supporting us. Um, but the main thing is please click that subscribe button somewhere around here or if you're watching the live stream right now. So it's somewhere around this video. And so you can uh, see other, uh, other slab streams that are coming uh, in the next few weeks. I had like some amazing guests. I'm excited and you should be excited as well. Um, comment if you want to, uh, if you have a suggestion, who should I feature next? Uh, please comment under this video, not in the live chat. Live chat is just for today. And uh, in order for me to see who would you like to, to see on the, on the, on the slap stream, uh, you have to comment down below and or any other suggestions. Um, please like, share it. And, um, and thanks so much for being with me and Tom Gray for amazing almost two and a half hours and thanks again to fernando slap from buenos aires for these slaptastic graphics i put down like a few links of his uh below the video as well and um there's like a bunch of videos you can follow me you can follow tom on social media and art of slab base make sure to check out art of if you like uh, slab base and anything slab base related, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And don't forget, never fret, slide it in smooth and keep it in a groove. This is Georgia, your friendly neighborhood bull fiddle cat, and I will see you next Saturday.